Exodus chapter 21, verses 7 through 11 is our opening text for the lesson. It says, when a man sells his daughter as an amah, servant, some Bibles say slave, she is not to leave as the manservants do. If she is displeasing to her master who chose her for himself, then he must let her be redeemed. He has no right to sell her to foreigners because he has acted treacherously toward her. Or if he chooses her for his son, he must deal with her according to the customary treatment of daughters. If he takes an additional wife, he must not reduce the food, clothing, or marital rights of the first wife. And if he does not do these three things for her, she may leave free of charge without any exchange of money. May Yahweh bless his word to our hearts today. Since I taught the last message, I covered Exodus 21, 7 through 8 in my last lesson in our study through the Torah. I have had several people reach out to me or comment saying, Brother Matthew, I appreciate the exegesis and understanding that you gave, and I have a lot better understanding about what is going on here. This is a scary text to a lot of people, and I spent the last lesson covering verses 7 through 8 and what it means for a man to sell his daughter as a servant, as an amah. It's what's called a difficult text in Scripture, but I do not believe that it is actually that difficult of a text. I think we just often come to the Bible with our own biases and presuppositions, and sometimes we're not ready to trust Almighty Yahweh in what He says. I want to encourage you today to let go of what you feel or think. Let it go. We each carry with us a certain mindset due to how we were raised, where we lived growing up, who we hung around in our family. And it's not that all of it is bad, but some of it is bad. So, for an example, Brother Matthew was raised eating pork. Anybody else here raised eating pork? Left the record shows a lot of hands that were raised. A lot of mouths that were raised eating pork. Not so much from my parents, but from my grandparents. Bacon or country ham was a staple breakfast food. Every morning you could smell it in the kitchen. So the first time somebody ever told me it's a sin to eat pork, because 1 John 3 verse 4 says sin is the transgression of the law, and one of Yahweh's laws is do not eat the pig, Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14. Somebody told me that the very first time. I thought it was silly. Why? Because that's how I was raised. That's how my family did things. But what about the first time that I found out that eating squirrel dumplings or fried frog legs was normal to some people? That's normal to some people. Now, it wasn't normal to me. Squirrel dumplings and fried frog legs was not a staple food in my home. But for some people, it is. I met them. The first time I found that out, I thought, that's ridiculous. That's gross. Even as a pork eater, that sounded gross to me. But for a lot of people in the South, it's normal right along with pig. And they think nothing of it. Why? Because they were raised that way. They have that bias. They have that presupposition. Do you see my point? We all have thoughts, feelings, and emotional attachments to different ways of living. And I'm encouraging everybody here to drop all of it and do your best to start with a blank slate when you study Read and study the word of Yahweh. Let him be your guide. Let him be your lead. Try your best to do that, specifically with his law. Now, some people will say this. Well, Brother Matthew, God wrote his law on my heart under the new covenant, and my heart just doesn't sit well with Exodus 21, 7 through 11. Well, I suggest to you and anyone listening that if your heart does not sit right with this law, then the Almighty has not written His law on your heart. That's right. Amen. Yep. Too often people twist the new covenant promise, and it's very subtle. Pay attention carefully, it's very subtle. The new covenant promise is that Yahweh writes His law on our heart. People twist that, though, and think our heart is now the law for the new covenant. You see that? It's very subtle. So they said we can go by our heart now. 
but they don't really think that he's actually written his law in their heart. They just want to kind of be the judge of what's right and what's wrong, what's a yes and what's a no. Very subtle twist. Christians think in their minds that they can just follow their heart and it will lead them in the right, the right direction. That's not the New Covenant promise. The New Covenant promise that actually hasn't been completely fulfilled yet is that Yahweh writes His law, including Exodus 21, 7 through 11. He writes it on our heart and on our mind so that we fully obey it and we do not need anyone to teach us anymore. Jeremiah 31, Hebrews 8, Ezekiel 36. That fully happens at the resurrection to immortality. But for now on earth, we do get a down payment. And it's an ongoing process whereby I believe if we read and study enough and we learn to love the Creator and we train our minds to think like Him, He is writing little by little His law on our hearts. So we cannot go by what we think or what we feel, else one person's heart will say this, let's have squirrel dumplings for supper. That's one person's heart because it don't condemn them. The next person's heart might say, we don't have to keep the Sabbath, Jesus is our rest. Yet another person's heart might say, well, I'm good with the Sabbath, but I cannot go along with a man selling his daughter to be an Amma. Well, all of that is trying to be right in your own eyes. Proverbs 3, Yahweh says, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear Yahweh and depart from evil. So you've got to learn to love Yahweh's law. You've got to train your mind to think like the Creator. I know sometimes we seem weird to people in the world and even people in the church world, but as long as we are abiding by Yahweh's law word, it's okay. Whom we seem weird to, right? Mm -hmm. And don't try to force feed everybody at one time. Give them a little bit at a time. That's right. A little bit at a time. So I'm going to pick up with verse 9 today. Or if he chooses her for his son, he must deal with her according to the customary treatment of daughters. Now, remember, the reason that the father sold his daughter into another family to be an ama. And the reason that she would not leave as the Ebed, the manservant, left on the seventh year is because, in this text, the Amma, the maidservant, was bought into a family and intended to become a wife in a new family. So if a dad was in dire straits and his circumstances were not good and he lived at the poverty level, he could sell his daughter into a family that was successful where she would be treated great and she would be reared up until the time of her marriage. And it says that in this case, she could be given to his son. We saw from verse 8 that she could be given to the master of the house. And if the master was displeased in her, it was considered an act of treachery. And so she was allowed to be bought back into her original family. So Yahweh is protecting the female. The point in verses 8 through 9 that I want you to see, she was sold for the purpose of becoming a wife in this successful family. Verse 9 does show us that the master of the house, the Adon of the house, may have bought her in order to give her to his son in marriage. So verse 8 and 9 give us two options. The master could choose her for himself as a wife, or the master could choose her for, her son, for his son in which case she becomes the daughter-in-law of the master and an honorary daughter. So then the master of the house, the father, will treat her after the customary treatment of a daughter. So, when my older sons, Benjamin and Elijah, they're both married now, when they got married, I gained two daughters. I didn't lose my sons. I gained two daughters. There's a beautiful book in the Deuterocanon called the Book of Tobit where there towards the end, it specifies that when your child gets married, when they, your daughter marries a, a man, you gain a son. When your son marries a woman, you gain a daughter. So I gained two daughters, Angel and Cassandra, whom I love. And technically, they're my daughters-in-law by marriage, but I now treat them as my honorary daughters, even though I didn't father them biologically. So if they call me and they need something, I help them in whatever way that I can. I give them a hug. I tell them I love them. I tell them I'm well pleased in them. And all of that is the customary treatment of a daughter. Exodus 21, verse 9. That's what's going on here. The master chooses the Amah, 
for his son to marry. She becomes a new daughter to the master. So he treats her like a daughter. But what about verse 10? This is where it gets a little bit too spicy for a lot of people. But we're going to teach this because we don't shy away from any Bible verse. We believe all of the Bible. Exodus 21.10 says, If he, that he there is the master. If you follow the he, if you write in your Bible, you can circle the he beginning back up in verse uh, 8. He must let her be redeemed. Just follow the he's. The he there is the master. So if he takes an additional wife, he must not reduce the food, clothing, or marital rights of the first wife. So this sounds like the master of the house is allowed to have more than one wife. Now, this is a big red flag for people in the world because how dare we believe in a book that says it's okay for a man to have two wives. Let me make a few comments before I talk about the scriptures a little bit. You know what's weird to me, and I've shared this with different people over time, our society today, our culture as a whole out in the world, believes certain things are good and certain things are bad. Whether or not they define them as righteousness and sin, they believe certain things are good and certain things are bad. So let me give you a few examples of what they believe is moral. <clears throat> they believe that it is okay for a man to be married to another man. That's looked upon as good and celebrated in our society in America. They believe that it's good and celebrated for a woman to be married to another woman. They think that it's okay for a man or a woman to just sleep around outside of marriage with the consent of anyone and everyone that wants to do that. They also think it's okay for a man to dress up like a drag queen and sit in front of a group of little children and read storybooks. That's okay and celebrated in our culture. They also think it's okay for a man to quote-unquote change his identity and become a woman and then they nominate that person to be woman of the year. Bruce, a.k.a. Caitlyn Jenner. They think that's okay, even though the person is a biological male. They also think that a woman can turn herself into a man and then be involved with whoever she, he, wants to be involved with, and they shout, in all of this, we celebrate this, love is love. But don't you dare say that it's okay for a man to have two wives. No, 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 no. We can't do that. That's not allowed. Many people in the world will tell you it's sick and misogynistic to believe such. The only reason that I can come up with as to why people in the world will allow and celebrate all that other stuff, but not allow and celebrate polygamy, not polygamy, but polygamy with an N, a man having more than one wife, is because it is allowed and regulated in Holy Scripture. I believe that's why the world is so against this teaching. Mm -hmm. It's because Holy Scripture allows it. But yet they'll allow all this other nonsense. So their heart is hard and calloused and their mind is warped to the point that they will celebrate all these other relationships which are all sinful according to Yahweh's law, but they'll condemn a man that has two wives, which although not commanded in the Bible, is allowed in the Bible. And by the way, the worldly phrase, love is love, is wrong. The biblical phrase is, love is the keeping of the commandments of Yahweh. That is all that love is. Nothing less, nothing more. It's the keeping of the commandments of Yahweh. 1 John 5, verse 3. Now, as you can tell, this is a spicy or sticky subject. I normally never bring this subject up with anyone because people have a hard time letting go of their emotions here. So I only comment on this when somebody asks me personally what Yahweh teaches in His Word. I do realize that this subject makes women of today, even holy women of today, uncomfortable. And I don't believe that a man should throw this subject or throw this teaching up in his wife's face. I don't believe that's righteous. As though he's holding it over her head or something. At the same time, if a man or a woman a man and a woman get married and they both understand this teaching 
And the first wife knows from the start <coughs> that the man may acquire another wife in the future, then there's nothing sinful or wrong with that. It is also fine for a man and woman to vow to each other in a monogamous marriage and stay true to that vow. That's fine. It is also fine for a man or a woman to be celibate and single for their entire life and stay true to that. And it is fine. I know a man right now, he's a very righteous man of Yahweh, and he's just turned 80 years old, and he never got married. He told me that he wanted to, and he said he almost did one time, but he's thankful he didn't marry a particular girl. But he never got married. And he said, once I got a little bit older, I just figured, well, I'm just going to serve the Creator. And now he's 80 years old, and he's been single, and that's fine. A lot of times the single people are left out in churches because everything is like centered in on marriage and people think that if they don't get married, maybe they're less than. And I think marriage is beautiful. It's wonderful. I, I love being married. I've been married almost now for 25 years. I love it. It's one of the greatest things I've ever done. Love my wife. i got a good wife. But you're not less than if you're single. As a matter of fact, in Scripture, it looks like if you stay single and celibate and devote your whole time to the Creator, it's more prestigious of a position than if you're married. You can find this in Matthew 19, 12, and also in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So, all of these are allowances within Yahweh's law, the ones that I've talked about. A man having two wives, a man having one wife, or a man or a woman being single. So before we exegete Exodus 21, verse 10, I want to take a few minutes to talk about some of the biblically approved examples of polygamy in Scripture. We often read about these in the Older Testament, and they're very plain and clear and easy to understand, but we read them and we don't really think about, hey, this was okay in Yahweh's eyes. So let's turn, let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of beginnings, the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 16. Here we have two people, one named Abram and one named Sarai. Abram and Sarai were married, but they had no children. Sarai was barren. She could not get pregnant. Well, Sarai had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, if you're looking at it, Genesis 16, verse 2, Since Yahweh has prevented me from bearing children, go to my servant. Perhaps I can have children by her. And Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So Abram's wife, Sarai, took Hagar, her Egyptian servant, and gave her to her husband, Abram, as a wife for him. So at that point, Abram had Sarai and Hagar. He had two wives. Now it is true that after Hagar became pregnant, Sarai resented her. But the resentment from Sarai stemmed from the very thing that she wanted to happen in the first place. She was barren and she said, maybe I can have a child by my handmaid. And she gave the handmaid that she had to her husband Abram to be a second wife. Now, Hagar, if you read the text, Hagar did walk around, and once she got pregnant, she started to look down on Sarai. So there was a feud between the two wives. Some people say that a man having two wives is wrong because whenever it was done in Scripture, it always caused problems. Well, I don't know of any marriage that has not had problems in it. I have people contact me all the time for marriage counseling. I'm not a marriage counselor. I'm a pastor. I can tell you what the Bible says, but I'm not a marriage counselor. But people call me and ask me, what do I do? And all of them that call me are monogamous relationships. They're monogamous marriages. So we're all flesh. We're all going to have spats and problems from time to time. If you try to use the argument that, you know, a man have two wives will cause problems, then a man that has one wife, they have problems too, so we should just all be single. That's where that argument eventually leads, and we know that Yahweh allows monogamy in Scripture. So I don't think that's a good argument. I could teach an entire sermon on Genesis 16, but the main point here is that this is what happened, and it happened without any inkling of Yahweh looking down on the practice or saying that it was sinful. Now, it is true that we cannot just look at what people do in the Bible and automatically think it's okay. Sometimes Yahweh's people, the people, <clears throat> the Hebrew people or the Israelite people, Many times they do what is wrong. But when they do what is wrong, it's condemned. Yahweh comes out and you see that it is sinful. But when one of Yahweh's people like Father Abraham, the father of faith, 
He does something and it's not condemned, but it's spoken of as a normal customary practice, then we can know that it's not just an example that we find in the Bible, it's an approved example that we find in the Bible. Let's move from here to Genesis 29. Genesis 29 and 30. Now we're going to move from Abram, whose name was changed to Abraham, and his grandson, his name was Jacob. One of his grandsons was Jacob. Many of you know this account. Jacob meets up with Laban, and Laban has two daughters, Leah and Rachel. Jacob fell in love with Rachel, and he agreed to work for Laban for seven years to get Rachel. That's true love right there, y'all. <laughs> Working for a man for seven years before you get his, to marry his daughter. He didn't receive her till to the, the seven years was up. That's a long time. So he really loved Rachel. The text actually says that to Jacob, those seven years seemed like they were only a few days because of the great love that he had for her. Absolute true love. So they hold this wedding feast at the end of seven years. They hold this wedding feast, and there's drinking and dancing at the wedding feast. But Laban held back Rachel, and he gave Leah to Jacob after the feast. When it got dark, he gave Leah. Now, Jacob didn't know it. He was tricking him. Some people have wondered, how in the world did he not know it was Rachel? Well, there's been a few suggestions. We don't know completely for sure. Um, there have been commentators, both ancient and modern, that say that Leah and Rachel were twins. Some say fraternal, some say identical. And the only difference was that Leah had what the Bible calls weak eyes. Some Bibles say delicate eyes. There is an Aramaic targum, an Aramaic paraphrase of this text, that says that the reason that Leah's eyes were weak or delicate was because she had spent a lot of her teenage years crying profusely, praying to Yahweh that she would not become the wife of Esau. <laughs> I don't want to be Esau's wife. And so she ended up getting uh, Esau's twin brother, actually, Jacob. Um, so they may have been twins. Jacob may have drunk a lot of, of wine at the feast. <laughs> Flavius Josephus in his commentary on Genesis says that. says that Jacob had a lot of wine, and so he, he didn't recognize her. Um, some people say that Leah may have had a veil covering her face. That's a possibility. What we do know for sure is that Laban tricked Jacob. But when Jacob approached him, look at this in Genesis 29, 26 through 27. Laban says this. When Jacob approaches him and says, Why did you give me Leah? I worked for Rachel. He says, It is not the custom in this place to give the younger daughter in marriage before the firstborn. And they could have still been twins even though there was a firstborn and a secondborn, this could have still been twin. 27, complete this week of wedding celebration, and we will also give you this younger one in return for working yet another seven years for me. <laughs> so Laban's getting a lot of labor out of this young man. So Jacob was given Rachel after one week. He completed a week with Leah, and then Laban went ahead and gave him Rachel, so he got her right then after seven days. But then he had to work for another seven years for Laban. Um, Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah. This does not mean that Jacob did not love Leah. He just had the initial preference for Rachel. And the point here is that all of this takes place in Genesis 29 and 30 without the slightest hint of Jacob having two wives as being sinful, weird, wrong, or anything negative. Nothing negative is ever said about Jacob having Leah and Rachel. But it gets deeper. There's more. When Laban gave his daughters away in marriage, he also gave each daughter a servant girl. The King James Version would call these women handmaidens. Handmaidens. The reason they were given is to help the wives around the house. We talked about this in Exodus 21, 2 through 6 with the manservant and the maidservant, cross-referencing Deuteronomy 15, 12 through 15. Leah was given Zilpah as her handmaid, and Rachel was given Bilhah. So at that point, Jacob had two wives, and each of the wives had a handmaid to help with the work around the house and the property. That word handmaid in Hebrew is not Amah. It is the Hebrew word Shifkah. Shifka. Now, beginning in Genesis 29, verse 31, Yahweh looks down from heaven and he sees that Leah 
is not loved as much as Rachel. And Yahweh has compassion upon Leah. And what does he do? He opens Leah's womb and she starts having babies like there's no tomorrow. And she loves it. Leah bears Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Now, as you move into Genesis 30, Rachel is getting upset because she wants to have a baby. Having babies is a wonderful thing. It's beautiful. So she goes to Jacob and she says in Genesis 30, give me sons or I will die. And that made me laugh when I was looking at it this week because I can picture Jacob when he hears Rachel say, give me sons or I will die. Jacob thinks, look, I'm doing everything I know to do. Honey. <laughs> I can only do so much. The Creator has to open your womb. And he does tell her in Genesis 30, verse 2, Am I in Elohim's place who hath withheld children from you? In other words, can I open your womb? I can't open your womb. So what does Rachel do? What does she do? She does the same thing that Sarai did towards Abram. Rachel gives her handmaid, Bilhah, over to Jacob as an additional wife. Jacob goes into Bilhah. Bilhah conceives. And Rachel says this. Look at Genesis 30, verses 3 and 6. She says, she will bear children for me so that through her I can build a family. Elohim, this is verse 6, Elohim has vindicated me. He has heard me and given me a son. How did Elohim give Rachel a son? Not through Rachel bearing it, but through her handmaid, Bilhah, whom she gave to Jacob as an additional wife, through Bilhah bearing Rachel a son. So we see even in way back in Genesis that the idea of adoption was... Right there. Adoption is actually a beautiful thing in the Bible. And you will not really understand the person and work of Yeshua unless you understand the concept of adoption. Anyhow, she named this son Dan, Genesis 33 and 6. So it does appear here that there was still a hierarchy among the wives in the marriage. Uh, Rachel over Bilhah and as we're going to see Leah over Zilpah. So Bilhah then later conceives again, and she bears another son whose name is Naphtali. Now, Leah stopped bearing children, but she wanted to keep up with Rachel because Rachel was starting to have children through Bilhah. She said, I'm not bearing any children. I've got to keep up with Rachel. And so she gives her handmaid, Zilpah, to Jacob as a wife. Genesis 30, verse 9. Jacob goes into Zilpah, she becomes pregnant, and she bears Gad, and later she bears Asher. And Leah names those two sons, just like Rachel named her son from the handmaid, but Leah names those two sons as well. Now, the point of all this is that this is where we get the 12 sons of Jacob, later known as the 12 tribes of Israel, from one man who had four wives, and there is nothing negative in all of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation about Jacob having these four wives. Nothing negative is ever said. Now one thing I like to point out to people here is that sometime during all of this there is a sexual immorality that takes place and is condemned. And this is with Jacob's firstborn son through Leah named Reuben. Reuben sleeps with his father's handmaid wife, Bilhah. Genesis 35, verse 22. Jacob Israel heard about it, the text says in the Hebrew. The Septuagint text, the Greek Old Testament, says that Israel heard about it and it was seen as evil in his sight. In Genesis 49, as Jacob is dying, he gives a few words to each of his children. And he begins with Reuben because Reuben is the firstborn biologically. But in Genesis 49, verses 3 through 4, listen to what Jacob says, Jacob Israel says about Reuben. He says, Reuben, you're my firstborn. You're my strength, and you're the first fruits of my virility. You excel in prominence. You excel in power, but you're turbulent as water, and you will no longer excel because you got into your father's bed and you defiled it. He got into my bed. That's mentioned again in 1 Chronicles 5, verse 1, where it says, These were the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel. He was the firstborn, but his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, son of Israel. Because Reuben defiled his father's bed, he is not listed in the genealogy according to birthright. The point here is that all of this is going on between Jacob, Rachel, Leah, Bilhah, and Zilpah. Nothing negative is ever said. But when Reuben lays with his father's handmaid wife, 
something negative is said. It is condemned because that is sexual immorality, whereas the other is not. Jacob having multiple wives was permissible. What Reuben did was not permissible. If what Jacob did was not permissible, something negative would have been said just like it was said about Reuben. This is just a small backdrop to the law in Exodus 21.10. Let's turn back there. The law here is still addressing the proper treatment of the Amah. And if you look at this text, uh, depends on what Bible translation you're reading, but the HCSB mentions the first wife at the end of verse 10. That first wife is a reference to the Amah that the master took. The additional wife is a wife that comes in second after he takes the Amah as a wife. Okay? The point here, though, of the law is that if the master later on takes an additional wife, the Amma, the first wife, is to continue to receive the necessities and benefits of her marriage. They're named here as food, clothing, and marital rights. Those things are not to be reduced from the first wife if a second wife comes into the picture. Again, Yahweh is protecting the female here. When it comes to these three things, food, clothing, and marital rights, the scholars and the commentators do not argue all that much about food and clothing. Although, although, Brother Sandy will like this. This will be cool, Brother Sandy. <laughs> the word food here doesn't just mean any food. It's actually the Hebrew word that means flesh. It's referring to meat. So you can't just give the ama beans and potatoes. She's got to get the meat. She's got to get the flesh. In other words, she has to be fed properly as a wife, right? The Septuagint text here in Exodus 21.10 reads like this. He shall not deprive her of necessaries and her apparel and her companionship with him. Now, I take this all together as food, clothing, housing, time, and intimacy. I think that's what's included in these three Hebrew words. Let me say it again. Food clothing, housing, time, and intimacy. All right? When a man takes a wife, she becomes one flesh with him, and he cannot set her to the side and treat her as someone less than. He is required to provide for her to the best of his ability. In the Hebrew Bible, the husband is always the primary provider of the home. Does it mean that the wife can't provide too? Read Proverbs 31. You know, she considers a field... She buys it, she sells it, she makes a profit, so forth and so on. Now, the last thing on this list, marital rights in the HCSB or in the KJV, conjugal rights. I think we're more familiar with that term. That term is debated among scholars because the Hebrew word there is onah, and it only is used one time in the Hebrew Bible. Exodus 21, verse 10. It's not used anywhere else, so you don't have anything to compare it with in the Hebrew Bible. Well, some scholars who read ancient texts that are related to Hebrew, like Sumerian and Akkadian, some of those old texts, they think that it doesn't refer to conjugal rights or intimacy. They think it refers to oil. Because in some of those Sumerian and Akkadian texts, food, clothing, and oil are listed as the necessities of life. That's some scholars. Other scholars point to the Septuagint, which uses the Greek word aposterio, which has to do with defrauding something. So those scholars will talk about the Greek word and then they'll go over to 1 Corinthians 7, verse 5, where it talks about a husband and wife and it says that the husband doesn't have power over his body, but the wife does. The wife doesn't have power over her body, but the husband does. And then it says, do not defraud one another except with an agreement to give yourself over to a time Season, I think it's talking about the Mohim, a time of prayer and fasting. So there can be times in the marriage where the husband and wife are getting ready for the, the seasons or the times, the appointed times, and they agree we're going to refrain from intimacy to purify, sanctify for the holy days. I think that's what Apostle Paul was talking about. And I think when you compare 1 Corinthians 7, 5 with Exodus 21, 10 in the Greek Septuagint, I think that's the best way to understand that. Marital rights is not limited to intimacy, but I do believe it includes intimacy. Now, you can read this played out. I would encourage you to read Genesis 29 and 30 tonight when you go home. You can read this played out between Rachel and Leah in Genesis 29, 14 through 16, because Leah 
she gets some mandrakes, which is a fertility thing. And she gets them from her son Reuben. He brings in some mandrakes at the time of the wheat harvest and gives them to Leah. And Leah <coughs> is wanting some time with Jacob. And she barters or <coughs> trades her mandrakes. She gives them to Rachel. And Rachel gives Leah her night with Jacob. So it appears that the women had designated times to be with Jacob. The main point is that the Amah that becomes the master's wife in Exodus 21.10, the commandment is saying she cannot be placed on the back burner when it comes to food, clothing, housing, time, intimacy, companionship. Her necessities in life must still be there if the master takes an additional wife. The concluding verse in this section, verse 11, says... And if he does not do these three, three things for her, the Amab, she may leave free of charge without any exchange for money. So the Amab, this girl that was sold into this successful family, if she's mistreated, if these things are not provided for her by the master whom she marries or by the son of the master whom she marries, she is not to be trapped into a bad situation. Again, Yahweh is protecting the female here. She is free to leave if the master of the house decides, I'm not going to provide for you any longer. You're not going to get the necessities. She can hightail it out of there. This is an additional verse that a lot of people don't go to. A lot of the scholars do, but a lot of people in church don't go to when talking about the issue of divorce and remarriage. The primary text is Deuteronomy 24 and the Law of Moshe. But this is another text that shows that divorce is permissible under Yahweh's law. Divorce can be ugly, but it also can be a good thing if a woman is no longer being loved and cherished by her husband. Now, I do realize that the same thing can happen to a husband, where a wife can get to the point where she's no longer taking care of her husband and acting deceitfully towards him. But the law of Yahweh, catch this, the law of Yahweh doesn't focus as much on the husband being mistreated. You know why? Because he was allowed to take an additional wife. So it protects the female in this case. So we have went over a lot in this lesson, and it's probably best if you go back over it slowly later on. I will have these notes on my website soon where you can study through them. I can send them, email them to you if you'd like to. The main ending point here is that this entire law in Exodus 21, 7 through 11 is for the betterment of a young lady to be in a successful family. And then when she's in that position, there's commandments for that family to follow. There's parameters for that family to follow. Else, she gets to leave freely without any exchange of money. No one is allowed to have complete control over the female as though she is not her own person made in the image of the Creator. A woman is a special treasure. A virtuous woman is worth more than the finest rubies in the world. And if you think that's a small statement, I encourage you, just look up how much real rubies cost. And there's no way I could afford any, any real you know, big rubies. But Proverbs 31 says her price is worth more than the finest rubies in the earth. Husbands, a wife is to be provided for and taken care of with all the necessities of life. That's a big point we're taught here in the perfect law of Yahweh. I have to get into the technical aspects and the specifics of Yahweh's law, but one of the principles this teaches us men is that when we take on a wife, we are required to provide for that wife. And provision doesn't just mean food. It doesn't just mean clothes or house. It means companionship. It means intimacy. It means the necessities of life. A wife is to be a man's friend. So, what a lesson, huh? Amen. What a lesson. Are you gonna be getting some phone calls tonight? The only reason I teach this <laughs> <laughs> the only reason I teach this is because it came up in the text. Amen. So I'm actually of the belief, I believe that if a, a man marries a woman and they begin the relationship out with the understanding of monogamy, I think that that is what needs to be stuck with. But I do think that a man could start off by saying if he's fond of a woman and she's fond of him, he could say, 
listen, I love you, but I might get a second wife down the line. And if she says, well, no way, Jose, that's not for me, then that's fine. She doesn't have to get involved in that relationship. We, we miss it because we're so far culturally removed from that way of life. But back then, it was just something that was understood. I mean, you see, Sarai and Rachel, they can't have children. Here's my handmaid. We're so far removed from that. But it is scriptural, and it's never condemned. So you can feel free to ask me questions after the service. I can take any questions, and I'll do my best to answer them. Do you love Yahweh? Yes. Do you still love Brother Matthew? Yes. You've got to love him to make it to the kingdom. <laughs> we'll close with this. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall think on it day and night. Be careful to do what God tells you to do, so that you will have good success. Don't turn to the right, don't turn to the left, but stay on the narrow path. Be careful to do what God tells you to do so that you will have good success. I love everybody. May Yahweh bless you.